All right, so continuing on after Heidegger's introduction to things like his terminology and uh, some of the concepts of his early essays, I wanted to now have an in-depth uh, look at Dasein and its different modes within being in time itself and some of the other influential concepts, uh, certainly with the likes of hermeneutics with Gadamer and post-metaphysics, as we see the soft ontology from his predecessors where, you know, uh, such as the medievals, for example, as he points out, where, you know, there's the, the ground of, of being uh, as, as, you know, passed down truth from God, um, as we've gone over with other thinkers, certainly, prior. So the post-metaphysics, or in this case, no absolute truth or access to that absolute truth. Um, there's no one culture, one person, one uh, world of or mode of, of knowledge that uh, can uh, be ontologically superior. Uh, and so if we were going to surmise what the three modes of being are, there's for Handenheit, zu Handenheit, and Dasein, or the existential, as he calls it. Um, the existential is, uh, you know, being engaged uh, in, in a sort of pre-ontological way where, you know, you're already in the world, you already have tasks at hand, you have things like hunger or thirst, uh, you don't really need to have an understanding of uh, things like that. Um, so as there's those pre-ontological way of looking at it, but you know, in his uh, writing itself, he looks at for Handenheit where um, it, it's really the essence and the, the present at hand uh, self-sufficiency. Uh, um, and, and what I mean by that really is there's the, um, you know, the theoretical aspect, certainly with something like Plato where, you know, there's these forms or um, being, if you will, that's sort of suspended, you know, away from the world itself. And, you know, you have this sort of access to these forms of, of, of knowledge and it's disembodied uh, from the world and it's the realm of uh, absolute subjects uh, reified as, as things. Um, you can think of uh, his mentor Husserl here really and how he tried in his uh, philosophy or his method to you know protect this sort of mature theoretical truths of prime numbers or mathematics uh, as a whole uh, this is really that sort of for height here where you know truth is placed here with a sort of transcendence uh, away from us uh, you see that with the Kajita or the uh, the self with the unity of perception in Kant uh, that really is a, a sort of introduction to what he means by the mode of Vorhandenheit, the sort of theoretical aspect um, to uh, our uh, uh, objects or uh, subjects. And so the existential, as we've talked about, is the sort of a priori structure is being in the world, this is a flip of, you know, metaphysics uh, before uh, Heidegger that took, you know, human subjectivity and sort of, you know, placed it away from, um, um, you know, actually being in the world as he'll describe. Um, and uh, he took the subjectivity as the form of, of different realms. Um, we are in this world as so long as we are involved with it. That really is how he wants to describe it as opposed, as opposed <laughs> to the spatial uh, aspect of just, you know, being inside of, you know, different containers or something like that. It's the, uh, you know, Dasein is the sort of the guide of, of activities. It's sort of has a verbiage attitude to where we're always involved with, uh, the world in some sort of, of way. And um, this will lead into 
I, I think I kind of brushed up on this on the last introduction video, but uh, Heidegger is very dense, so it, it could be necessary here when he talks about facticity. Um, you know, that has to do with your your thrownness of of you know being placed in this certain culture and and, and, and space and time where you're, there's this you know truths about culture that is handed down to you. Um, you know, something like uh, being masculine. You know, we have truth about masculinity. Uh, through our ideals of, of culture. And so that is that sort of facticity or, or truth. Whereas with Zu Handenheit, I always think of it as technology or the actions on hand or tools of equipment, as he describes. Uh, ready to hand this as it, as it shifts through. Um, and, and so, of course, there's this, you know, turning, if you will, um, that breaks from... Uh, you know, Zuhanden hide a sort of tool, a hammer, if you will, uh, becomes theoretical when it's problematized, if it doesn't work anymore, or in its descriptions and language, as we'll get into. So the example really would be the tool might be missing. Uh, that's a, in addition to, you know, breaking off. Uh, and it's moved from ready to hand to presence at hand. Uh, presence at hand being, of course, uh, in, in that theoretical aspect and so he really you know mishes that together with the concept of of nature as presence at hand uh, which is then coded you know by our human human aspect of 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 being uh, uh in the human world with the ready to handness that sort of um imperial implicit assumption really within uh human beings of, of coding nature into this presence at hand. But I also wanted to, uh, you know, look at um, a very specific chapter in particular that I find very influential, which is the worldhood of the world. The world shows itself in its entities. Uh, you don't have a description of the world in and of itself to exhibit being of those entities in the world. So, you know, you don't have a sort of totalizing aspect of what the world actually is. You have entities that uh, have relation to each other that uh, comprise our projection uh, out of the world. And so he talks about substantiality. Uh, entities in the world are things described within the world or objects, but not the world presupposed before those entities. Um, so you have access to the common world as opposed to being lost in its subjectivity. He's very concerned with uh, the commonality of our world as opposed to just uh, sliding off into, you know, just pure subjectivity or that sort of uh, theoretical way of, of thinking that he wants to combat against. And so the ready to hand and it's uh, has a sort of uh, precursor to you know, being regional. So, you know, the graveyard, for example, is orientated towards the sun and the sunset. Just as the sun positions in a cathedral or a, a house, there's, you know, the mass happens on a specific side because of the position of the sun. And so, you know, you have, you know, regional aspects to your being that will ultimately, you know, play that sort of, of part of, you know, being in a sort of uh, regional aspect. And of course, he's also going to warn that, you know, uh, the sciences and this sort of uh, theory, if you will, uh, of, co of overcoding is uh, taking away the sort of regionalist. There's a sort of, um, um, well, not sort of, a, a very implicit um, commentary within uh, his texts where you know, we're losing that sort of regionalist. He describes something like the Rhine River, for example, and it's hymns that uh, uh, were culturally enriching for the Germanic people. Um, you know, it just becomes uh, at hand within nature to, you know, uh, funnel through with technology and, and becomes uh, uh, objectified. And so when he talks of moving on here with the ontical world, the entities uh, conceptually in the world in its totality of entities which are present at hand in the world in its presence at hand, 
wherein through facticity of being in the world, uh, what is worldly isn't given at hand. So we have these sort of worldly aspects to things um, that uh, uh, philosophers prior to him, he takes umbrage with, with, you know, the, the common uh, world, uh, such as, you know, hydration or hunger, as I've described, that uh, Dasein uh, inhabits. Uh, you don't have experience of phenomena of the world, but in its dealings or concerns that are near you, such as entities of things used or on hand in its environment. Um, so the environment is populated by entities that are, are used. So uh, this is how he, you know, launch pads into things as uh, pragmata, uh, which is an etymology equipment, we shall call entities which we encounter in concern. Equipment isn't an entity or being, but as essentially treated or acted upon by Dasein and how it's ordered. So, you know, we're always ordering um, equipment, if you will, uh, based on that. And so Dasein or our concern with the world uh, is in its average everydayness organized uh, based off of concern or, as we'll see with mood, um, into that readiness to hand with Zuhandenheit. So just to be more concise here with uh, problematization, if you will, um, and also it's, it's interesting how he uh, talks of, uh, you know, production itself uh, is organizing uh, to the world at hand. Uh, and so the present to hand theoretical is uh, different than what he calls circumspection, uh, which is unlike uh, the ready to hand, which of course is just you know something that for uh, if we're going to be uh, um, I don't know if Heidegger would accept this term, but you know the ready to hand is that sort of smoothness that uh, that smooth transition that someone like Dewey would talk about later uh, in American pragmatism, where you know there's no problem with something, then you just sort of take it for granted, take it uh, uh, um, on hand. Uh, but when problems arise from the ready to hand, such as equipment and average everydayness, this will withdraw to the theoretical uh, presentation. So equipment really is a breaking or a disturbance. Uh, and then the environment returns or announces anew in its disclosure when it return, if it's fixed or um, uh, whatever the case may be, if it's found uh, again, um, you go from the you know ready to hand into uh, the theoretical mode through problematization. And um, now this next part I think is really important in the chapter where he talks about the sign structure. And so signs show or indicate through reference. Reference is very important in its relation, but not every relation is a reference. Uh, among signs, uh, as he describes, there are, are traces or residue or symptoms that I talked about in the last video. Sign is an arrival of equipment for a driver in regards to you know, something like turn signals, as he describes with early uh, automobiles. Uh, the turn signal ready as hand through sign as a symptom. Um, and so indication then is a form of referring. Uh, indicating as a reference is a way in which towards uh, serviceability becomes concrete. And so that's when you, you know, ascend ontology there. Uh, referring, at, referring as indicating serves into the being structure ontology uh, as a concrete uh, way through the structure and its reference or ground of being. Signs, then, let the ready to hand be encountered in secure orientation uh, with concernful dealings. Uh, the wider, though, as he describes, which I think is very important for something like our culture now today. So the wider the extent of a sign, uh, the more narrow. Uh, uh, so if you have a wide sign, as it were, um, uh, its significance or its usefulness uh, won't be as total uh, won't be as useful than uh, um, in its total than 
um, when you use the narrowing uh, process um, and it becomes you know more specialized intelligence or uh, useful so having these overarching signs as we see with uh, the degradation of language uh, today where somehow things manage to be everything and uh, nothing at, at the same time in our signs um, these signs are, are depleting then because you're you're not able to narrow down and, and actually use it in an intelligible or useful way um, when you're using uh, uh, large encompassing uh, signs um, and so uh, when he describes the environment then the fundamental concerns I have toward a sign a sign is something ontically ready to hand which serves as equipment the environment becomes accessible for uh, circumspection and so the uh, ontological structure of reference at hand uh, and the worldhood of the world and then he moves on into uh, being with uh, that sort of common world if you will or the mitzen or they uh, world of, of they or everydayness uh, in that sort of fallen stage of, of Dasein of average everydayness the world of being with coexistence uh, is his critique of of not being a sort of isolated ego but actually being in what's described as the myth belt with others um, and so we see what he dips into you know the modern world there's a sort of indifference in the cosmopolitan uh, environment where um, this sort of new worldhood that he uh, fears is coming, which we you know, all live in uh, for the most part today, where you have that world cosmo where everyone is trying to be uh, inconspicuous towards each other. Um, this ties in with one of my oldest um, video essays on the channel that was inspired by this chapter. Um, quantities of, of color where you know every single uh, um, racial difference really has been you know broken down uh, from uh, an ontological way of, of looking at uh, things um, uh, and now it, it's just sort of the the oppressor and, and, and the oppressed uh, in this sort of historical fashion um, this is uh, uh, this I think is is mistaken um, and so what we actually are seeing is inconspicuous people themselves are starting to take on that sort of zoo Honden height property of, of just blending into the background and sort of ready to hand this or, uh, um, um, and so technology, of course, uh, which is one of Heidegger's, uh, paramount concerns, uh, Technology effaces the things and ontological and the ontologies that come with it are blurred together to make us into uh, these sort of properties of, of Zuhandenheit. Das Mann or the anyone or the they, uh, distantiality, one's own Dasein becomes subjected or submits to the they. And so we see with his sort of critique of the coming of the world of, of mass consumption versus the authentic self, which is uh, a big theme, of course, in all of Heidegger's, uh, uh, not just being in time, but uh, future essays. Um, uh, one of the reasons why I think he's, you know, writing, uh, being in time and, and, and spending time on these essays and, and critiquing technology is, you know, we're, we're stepping away from that authentic self and going into this world of, of mass conception, uh, um, consumption, sorry. Um, so one becomes a subject properly through, uh, you know, this difference of, of the average or, or the fallenness, trying to, um, you know, go about finding your authentic self despite the idle chatter, despite all these cliches around you. Um, you know, there's uh, that, that fearful aspect of, of, of just following along with the village instead of the path of the forest. And of course, uh, for anyone who is interested in, in being a dissident, then um, this is inspirational for 
Ernst Jünger, who's going to uh, write about the Forest Passage. And of course, Heidegger himself uh, lived, uh, you know, sort of cabin side in the sort of black Germanic forest of, uh, of where, you know, your paths, they could be dark, they, they could be very fearful, but, um, you know, you still have to, um, you know, try to find your authentic self because if you don't, it, uh, this, this world of mass consumption isn't going to actually lead you to, uh, the sort of life you actually really want and you'll be haunted by it, whether it's, uh, through anxiousness, which we see with modern man, uh, in particular, uh, in the, this hypermodern world where, you know, cliches and, 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 um, the passing of fads and sort of, um, social, uh, upheaval with regards to, you know, standing up for what you actually believe in, um, this will, you know, pick apart at your psyche. And we see with, you know, the crisis of, of mental health uh, that just continues to get worse and worse. And, um, you know, we're turning to drugs and trying to just treat the sort of symptoms. But, um, you know, this is actually, you know, dealing with the disease itself. And so if we're going to then look at, you know, chapter five being in as such, um, understanding and uh, the state of mind constitutes Dasein being in the world. And so he's going to then shift to mood as the state of, of, of mind, which is a uh, departure, of course, from the likes of Husserl, who you know, thought that the theoretical um, you know, knowledge-seeking aspect was um, you know, the understanding. But um, Heidegger here is, is going to focus on the attunement of mood to the world you are in, such as anxiety or dread. Uh, and so, you know, your thoughts or your theoretical truths uh, can be based off of your situation in the world. And that's really where he introduces that concept of throwedness or mood facticity, uh, then into a certain place or time, and one uses language or as he would describe later beyond this text as the house of being to construct those worlds from our moods in particular traditions of facticity. Um, and so thrownness, we are thrown into our destiny. Uh, there's definitely that sort of mythological aspect, you know, who's actually throwing us? Heidegger doesn't have an answer for us, but I think if we looked prior, he would likely uh, say that this is, you know, the ground of, of, of being, it, uh, or, or, or the, or the, the big being, if you will. Um, um, and so there, there's sort of that destiny of limitations, you know, you're thrown into a, a world of limitations based off of your facticity or, uh, circumstance, that sort of, uh, destiny of, of karma and, and trying to deal with the, you know, the task that Dasein, uh, puts forth to you. So understanding is not passive, but it's a projection onto our throne understanding. So we're projecting the worlds or the construction as the response to being thrown into the world uh, in order to make sense of it, in order to understand each other. And so this, of course, ties into the theory of interpretation. And so the, from the projection of the understanding and its global view, interpretation has a more specifics or you know regionally bound that sort of um, culture uh, uh, versus uh, global um, you know theory uh, that you kind of see in Spangler for sure um, this is seen now with interpretation it has that sort of regional aspect to it uh, in order to understand uh, things around you interpretation is a focus uh, really that's uh, meant for regionality or that sort of pre-ontological uh, in order to interpret. You already know what something is, uh, such as you know music, even though you don't know perhaps uh, the specifics of it, um, you already know things. Um, um, and so interpretation really has a sort of a priori aspect um, because we're already able to interpret. Um, and so meaning then isn't found in the present at hand, 
except for how Dasein understands or fails to have, uh, Dasein brings meaning with it. Um, and this, I think, uh, is where he will jump from uh, language to assertion. And so assertion is very key to understand uh, because it's uh, into the words of description shifting into the realm of language. Words are not necessary, of course, uh, for that interpretation in that a priori aspect. Language is definitely a, a uh, goes towards something um, of problematization uh, to communicate to each other beyond just, uh, you know, if you, if you understand something already or have an interpretation for it, um, there's that sort of one-to-one -one aspect of everything, you know, moving fluidly, like in that uh, John Dewey way. But assertions uh, points out or predicates and narrows down uh, beyond just, you know, pointing a, a, out a problem. Uh, but it gives character um, to, uh, you know, these tools or objects um, based off of its problemization itself. Um, and so you narrow down the attributes such as, you know, the hammer being too heavy. Uh, other aspects of it are, 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 are brushed aside to focus on how heavy the hammer is. Um, so something happens in the for having to assert about the hammer uh, ontologically changes with which we are to do changes to about something or present at hand. So assertions shift from that hermeneutic interpretation uh, as an ontology of one of uh, apophantic uh, uh, as it shifts uh, to the realm of, of language. Um, he doesn't have uh, the full-fledged language theory and being in time itself that he will have lang later with, you know, something like the house of being or something. But uh, apophantic uh, is his idea of the horizon of the or scheme of the past, present, and future uh, at hand. Um, and so when he turns to the discourse of human language and dialogue, dialogue is the connection of and uh, the sort of way in which we hear each other um, and we see with other civilizations such as with the Hindus for example um, as compared to the Greeks where there's um, you know dialogues uh, with Hindus it was it was this sort of verbal instruction where you just simply listen to uh, the dialogue or lack of dialogue just the monologue if you will um, and so Hindus uh, civilization really uh, uh, didn't have writing before the British uh, uh, came and, and, and wrote down all of these uh, stories. Um, it was just the oral teaching, whereas you know someone like Socrates in, in uh, uh, Greek civilization, um, you have this sort of dialogue, the going back and forth. Um, and so uh, this leads to his... Uh, his fallenness of, of, of language with uh, dissipation. Um, and that is through the they and the idle chattel, uh, chatter, sorry. Chattel might be a, a, an appropriate word too with uh, something like the herd with Nietzsche. Um, and so everydayness of Dye's line uh, in the they uh, really takes on that vulgar cosmopolitan and being uh, in the city and its corruption and uh, dissipates us into fallenness. And so he also describes uh, two other aspects of, of language of curiosity, where you move, or the fallenness of language, if you will, where you move from the spectacle, spectacle, uh, the crowd and, and the trends that we talked about earlier, of everyday, uh, you know, idle life, um, and, and just moving on uh, what he describes as uh, ambiguity, where you just have these sort of fashion trends where just simply being new uh, or, or trying to find the new, uh, not, um, not because of, uh, of, of the use of care as he would want, but um, it's just simply a stimulation of, of, of just moving from trend to trend or, or trying to predict what the next trend will be. Um, and that's why uh, we are beings who are abandoned. Um, 
everything becomes this sort of superficial without any aura to actually authentically understand as opposed to you know the sort of global language we see in global fads uh, there's no regionalness there's no um, um, sort of aura to our historicism or anything like that and so you have the structural structural fold of Dasein um, as he describes with uh, anxiety as primordial um, Dasein is disclosed anxiety uh, fear of being in the world as such uh, nowhere of, of not being uh, specific um, anxiety man is exposed like a shell such as problems or psychological problems and um, you know things controlling our ego uh, and we see this with possession and, and, and uh, comic book villains um, modern man is in this uh, state of anxiety because uh, uh, capital being is uh, eluding us now um, and so if we were to move to Dasein and its structure for being as care the primary uh, ontology of organization to the world which is through emotion or mood based into the world as opposed to uh, the theoretical approach and then I finally wanted to hone in as well on his idea of, of reality, which is rather interesting. Reality, of course, for Heidegger is just one mode of being compared to uh, the others uh, demonstrated uh, prior. So it isn't privileged as, you know, reality is this, it, it has this sort of ontology, but um, it's inadequate actually for... Uh, Dasein, consciousness or cognition isn't that sort of primary way of, uh, of dealing with the tasks of, of, of average uh, every, everydayness. Um, reality, as Heidegger would say, cannot be proven. Um, reality uh, has an aspect of care to it. Care is the primary mode of orientation. It's not theoretical or problematic making reality subordinate to Dasein uh, as one mode of being amongst those others. Um, and then if we were going to then turn to his problem of truth. And so this uh, ties into his critique of Plato's forms where truth is out there in another realm or as Kant would describe it in the Western world, um, Kant says that truth is in our own minds and then we use our minds to conform objects um, both in this way requires um, correspondence to each other in the unconcealing uh, but for Heidegger truth is a quest of, of disclosure to the hidden realms through assertions to be probed into reality and um, so when he talks about things like the clearing, you're setting, uh, you know, properties towards the truth uh, as you clear away uh, to, uh, you know, come about a, an understanding. This is, of course, very important to pin down when it comes to his influence of, of destruction, uh, you know, wiping away the cliches, wiping away that sort of uh, the fallenness and actually trying to, you know, see the opening. Um, this is for, you know, Derrida when he comes in, you know, uh, deconstruction. Um, he's trying to, you know, peel back the institutions or modernism. Um, and um, this really highlights how in that chapter particularly you have the sort of end of, of, of hard ontology or, or, or metaphysics. Um, but yeah, this is really to highlight all of the main concepts and ideas to really come out of being in time and how it will influence the channel going forward with pretty much every thinker really from here on out. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we were as thorough as we could be with being in time since we're going to talk about the likes of Gadamer and hermeneutics and um, of course um, um, the sort of post-metaphysical age to come in uh, post-modernism uh, as Heidegger is a you know, direct descendant of uh, post-modernism. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, somewhat comprehensive uh, video on, on, on most of the ideas within being in time itself 
And I'd like to also perhaps do one more video on some of his essays to follow that were rather influential as well. Uh, as always, like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, comments definitely help with the algorithm, so I'd appreciate that. Uh, but yeah, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys for the next video.